like a cat. Yay! <laughs> okay, um, I'm glad you guys could all make it to Basket Weaving 101. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, we are really excited uh, to have Stuart come here tonight to give us some information about lamprey. They're definitely um, sort of a mysterious creature that's out there. Um, one of our office mates, uh, partners called them nightmare ocean snakes, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. So, you know, but everybody has- We're gonna has, work on that yeah, tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell us who you are. Oh, I'm coming, I'm coming. So I'm Kelly Timchak and I'm the coordinator for the Lower Rogue Watershed Council. And I collectively work for the Curry Watersheds Partnership. Liesl, can you come up here for just a minute? Um, our other partner, Miranda Gray, she runs the South Coast Watershed Council and she is on vacation this week. So we also have Liesl Coleman, who's the district manager at the Curry Soil and Water Conservation District. So, <laughs> and uh, so we've been formalizing our relationship a little bit more. We've all worked together over the last 25 years, not us specifically, but the groups. And so now we're a little bit more structured and we kind of call ourselves the Curry Watersheds Partnership. So. I did put some information in the back table if you guys are interested. There's um, pamphlets about kind of what we do, the type of restoration that we do. I put our cards back there. Um, I put sort of like what our needs are right now in the organization. If you do feel like making a donation, there's a donation pot back there. Otherwise, bathrooms are through the hallway there. The door is open if anybody needs that. Was there anything else? No. Beer. Beer, yeah, if anybody needs a beer, there's some Art Rock Pale back there. They were kind enough to donate that to the, to the big tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you guys. What a great turnout. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah. Friday night. Thank you for supporting Lamprey. To me, this feels like a big support of Lamprey, too, which is kind of unknown. So I will, without further ado, bring Stuart Reed up because he's our amazing biologist that's going to come and talk to us tonight. So thank you. Okay, so, whoop, I'm on the wrong side. Um, thank you all for coming. We're going to chat about lampreys. There's one ground rule in this conversation. I'm an independent biologist. I work from Canada down into northern Mexico on fish conservation, land stewardship. I work with everything, all the fishes except for salmon. So, as we said, don't ask me questions about salmon. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of other fish out there that nobody, that everybody's sort of ignoring that can, can use somebody on their side. Um, one of the things about when I'm giving a talk, it's very important that you understand I cannot be interrupted. Okay? It's impossible to interrupt me. So what I'd really appreciate is that anybody out there who has a question, interrupt me. Ra don't even raise your hand. Just talk. I'd like to see this as a more of a conversation and we're gonna cover a lot of ground, and so there'll be things that suddenly occur to you that have nothing to do with the particular thing we're talking about. Feel free to go, wait a second, you said such and such a while back. How does that relate or whatever? And we can follow that thread. And that way the, the whole conversation kind of follows your interests and the things that you'd like to learn. So please interact, uh, there's no problem there whatsoever. The first thing I want to do to kind of get us in the mood for lampreys, one of, one of the goals of the talk is that at the end of this, people have learned one thing, and that is that this is not a salmon. Okay? <laughs> so I want to start off here with a little video we took up on the Eel River, up in the upper Eel River. This was in 20... 2017. Why are they going up that waterfall? To get to the other side. <laughs> How far up the river is that? That's up at Van Arsdale, uh, up below Scott Dam. At the Van Arsdale Dam, it's about 160 miles upstream. Why do they want to get to the other side? <laughs> Sex. <laughs> okay. So these are a really unique sort of creature that we're not used to working with. And usually I ask how many people have seen a lamprey, but I understand 
Here in Gold Beach, they drop out of the sky on people. So it's, it's not a fair question. So I'm assuming a lot of people have seen a lamprey. And now, let's see here. We'll go to the talk and to the slideshow. That was in probably early June. This year? 2017. 2017 was a, a, a real banger year. Um, and uh, 2018 was kind of, kind of cool. 2019 has been going pretty, pretty good here. So let's see, I think I have to push the button each time. So again, uh, that's me. That those are lampreys. This is a drawing by Ray uh, Rene Reyes um, down in the Sacramento Valley. He does uh, nature drawings and such, and has done some shirts for us and things. That uh, yeah. Those would be the tunnels on the left creature We're going to get to that. <laughs> this is my daughter Olivia and field companion. Okay, so first off, lampreys have been around for a long, long time. And a lot of people, when they hear, you can see here's a modern lamprey, here's what a lamprey may have looked like 400 million years ago, and you look at them, they're not very different, you go, wow, that's a very primitive fish. But it's important to think that a fish that has been around for 400 million years and outwardly hasn't changed much, it doesn't mean it's been sitting still. So while all these other species have been trying all these different approaches to the world, lampreys have taken their approach and refined it. So I don't think of lampreys as primitive, although they don't have any bones, they don't have a, a backbone, they have a small knot of cord, so they're the most uh, primitive the, the most primitive. Aren't those gill slits? Aren't those gill slits? They're in the sixties. They haven't changed forever. Gill slits. Gill slits haven't changed. They, they. You can see here. These are the gill slits. Paul's talking about, and the. Uh, they have no. They have no bones in their mouth. They have no jaws. They have teeth that are made out of chitin. But they're very good at what they've been doing, or they wouldn't be here. So whenever I'm working on lamprey, and you're going to see me wave my arms a lot. When I say, oh yeah, well lampreys do this, they're in this stage for five to seven years, and I'll wave my arms, and that means eh, I'm really not too sure, because we don't know very much about them, surprisingly. But they've figured it out. So I'm going to kind of follow the structure of a life cycle. We'll kind of start with the egg. Lampreys are interesting because they have a very long larval stage, which is referred to as an anaceet. They then transform to what's in the Pacific lamprey is called the macrothomia and turn into an adult. So there's these very distinct stages that in the old days were considered different species because they look so different. Lampreys are very productive. This is actually a little brook lamprey over in the Goose Lake Basin. And They'll spawn the small lampreys, about a thousand eggs, but a big Pacific lamprey, like the ones that drop from the sky in Gold Beach, they're producing about 200, 250,000 eggs in a summer. Sure, are you saying these are from Goose Lake and they're not anandromous, those go over to Goose Lake? Absolutely not. We, lampreys have extreme diversity in this area. In fact, the Klamath Basin and Goose Lake contain about a fifth of the world's lampreys. There are seven species in the Klamath Basin. Only one here in the row, but seven in the Klamath Basin. But most of what I'm going to say today is going to apply to the Pacific lamprey, which we have here in, in the row. However, this is a Miller Lake lamprey. Uh, lampreys, when they hatch from the egg, the egg is about the size of a pinhead. When they hatch from the egg, they're about the size of an eyelash. So we refer to these as eyelashes. They're about the size of an eyelash. And you can see here, this is a lamprey that's up in the upper Klamath Basin, but the anaceids are similar. You can see sort of an approximation of different year classes. It kind of becomes fuzzy here. But generally, in we 
think that amicetes are going five to seven years in their larval stage. So a five to seven year old larva. During this- How did you get eaten all that time? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> and they burrow in the sand. Could you repeat the questions? Because they're hiding. Oh, Paul, I'm sorry, but nobody can hear you on the camera. You're hiding. <laughs> okay, so the question is how do, how do amicetes keep from getting eaten? If they're very tasty, they can get eaten them. Um, they live for five to seven years, and what they do, if you look at this guy, he has no eyes. He has no mouth part. He has no teeth. He has no sucker mouth. See, so you say, well, that's a pretty helpless thing. Well, they live down in the sediment, and they filter the water. So they're a filter like a mussel is. So when you think of what's the role of lampreys, the first thing people think of is, well, they glom onto fish and suck their guts out. But actually, most of their time is spent filtering the water in the creek. In fact, I was just down in the Carmel and San Luis Obispo drainage about three weeks ago, and we have a project where the city of San Luis Obispo is looking at the filtering of amicetes as a way to control, a biocontrol on um, coliform bacteria in the creek that runs through town. We'll see if that works. But they certainly filter a huge amount of water in the system. What kind of a sediment is that that they're in? Um, that's an artistic sediment. <laughs> <laughs> this is sand, and we'll talk a little bit about the kind of, of sediments they prefer, because while they live in fine sediments, they are kind of particular about what kind of fine sediments. They don't have, how they, they do the sort of they amount, what are they doing? No, they're filtering, so they, they're bringing it, you can see the little, up here, they're filtering the water, bringing it down, they have a basket inside the brachial chamber no where no their water. gills are, they're passing the water through that, no and cleansing it. They don't like salt. They don't like salt. At this stage. At this stage, here's the deal. This is one of, I'm going to wave my arms a little bit because we find them in fresh water. We don't find them particularly in the, not, they're not in salt water at all, but we don't find them in the estuary. However, the equipment we use to look for them is, uses a, a slow pulse of electricity and it doesn't work when you get into higher salinities. So that may explain some of it, but mostly they're, mostly they're upstream. And part of that is, if you're going to live in the sediment for five to seven years and occasionally come up and look for another spot, you don't want to be too far to the, close to the bottom of the river or you're going to end up out in the ocean where you're not ready to be yet. So typically we see them quite a ways up in the river. And, and all the way down, I mean, you get, them, you get them there in front of Lobster Creek. I mean, they're at that point in the road easy. So when they're in there, it isn't that they don't get eaten. There are an awful lot of them, and the ones that get found get eaten. And the ones that die become part of the bottom sediment, or part of the bottom uh, food web. And so they do represent an important food resource for all the other fishes and smaller creatures that are in the, in the river. So we were talking, you were asking about what sort of sediment do they like. And so if you look at this river here, here's the electrical equipment we use. This river here, I usually wear shorts. This is an old, old picture. Maybe I didn't. Uh, anyway, they're not out here in the, in the flowing water. They're in this little backwater, in this eddy, where the fines collect. However, they're not over, when we get over into here, or even into here, where you get a lot of organics. So when you walk into a backwater like this and it goes bloop, 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 and you start getting gases out, characteristic of anoxia, too much organic decomposition, they're not in there. They're really in this clean spot here. And what they're using it for is, remember they're filter feeding. So if you're gonna suck particles out of the water, you don't want them rushing by at full <coughs> speed, but you need enough of a current that it brings particles past you. So they want to be right here in this eddy, and if you look in these eddies, 
It's a very rich environment. This is where you find, for example, dead fish. You find organic debris. You find leaves, all of which have a lot of um, bacterial um, coating on them. There's a big bacterial community. There's diatoms in there. There's all kinds of stuff that are nice to filter out of, out of the water. Cold water, particularly cold water. So we're going to look at the distribution, and I was just talking with some of Brian today uh, about a project we have looking at temperature distribution. Mm -hmm. And people who are in the north of their range, like up on the Olympic Peninsula, are all like, oh man, I'm really worried because the water's going to get warm in lampreys or in cold water. Whereas people in Southern California say, who's worried about warm water? And so lampreys are all the way, it turns out, from Southern California, from actually Northern Baja, all the way up into Alaska. So they're adapted to a very broad range of temperatures. Did you say the clam basin holds a third of them or something? So About a fifth of the world species are in the climate basin. And well, it's an old, it's an old place with a lot of different habitats in it. You have the lake habitat, you have river habitat, you have small springs. And so there's just been a lot of diversification there. Plus, no, you that's the middle of the range, too. That's exactly the middle of the range. Well, are no, actually, yeah. lampreys are global. So primarily in the northern hemisphere, but they're global. But the climate has something about it that has produced a lot of diversity, sort of like what we call a species flock, like you'll see in the African lakes and things like that, where you get a whole bunch of one group of very similar closely related animals that have filled a lot of different niches and diversified. Question. Yes. You're talking about them being used down in um, Yahoo and Bisco to filter out cold form from there? From in the creek. Yeah. That we're, we're, we're doing an experiment to see how well that works. But well, yes, that's the idea. It sounds like that's an undesirable thing in that water system. Well, it's a, it's a bacteria. If you're consuming, if you're adapted to filtering bacteria, okay. right. you don't They're care. And these are coliform bacteria that are coming out of pigeons mostly. Okay. So to a fish, a cold water fish body, it's food. Okay. Right. Yeah, but good question. So when I talk about there being amacetes, larvae in the sand, this is from a couple of shovelfuls of sand in Miller Lake, I believe, originally. But <clears throat> when we go into these little streams, often the highest biomass of fish in these little coastal streams aren't all the little trout swimming around or the little bit. It can be amicies. So when you're down there at the swim beach and your toes are in the sand, you've got company. <laughs> We're digging in on the sand, but we these are out of the sand, yeah. You do a Kate, yeah, question there? Are these five to seven year old? Uh, these big, yeah, these big guys are five years old. <laughs> we actually. Is there seven that's full? Somewhere in there, they will turn into a macrothomia similar to a salmonid smolt. Oh, sorry, Sam. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm disrupting them from the name of science. If I take this bucket load and I throw it back in the, in the sand, within about 30 to 40 seconds, you won't be able to see it. You, you'll have an empty sand bottom. In fact, we, we just collected about 100 of them and put them in this aquarium that they had prepared for the experiment. And all the students wanted to see what was going to happen and everything. And we put them in. It's, it's just an empty aquarium full of sand. And suddenly there were a hundred squirmy amicids all over, and about a minute later there was there was a, a tail or two kind of sticking up, and other than that it was empty. So, um, and they seem to be very durable. Um, they're they're quite tough tough in captivity. One of the things that lampreys have the ability is to utilize their own body resources um, for nutrition. So we'll talk about it a little later. The adults actually will shrink when they stop feeding. 
quite substantially. And the same thing in Amacete is able to stop feeding, for example, in the winter, and they'll shrink a little bit, and then they start growing again. So just, again, because the amicids are so important in our creeks, when we think about what's the role of lampreys in our system, besides smattering across the parking lots of Gold Beach, the, <clears throat> the adults are very important as a food resource, but the amicids are bioengineers in our stream beds. It's sort of like if you were to have a garden and say, I don't want any worms in my garden, you'd have a similar loss as you would have with no amicids in the stream bottoms. So after they spend their time filter feeding, they have no eyes, they hang out in the bottom, and then suddenly they go through this amazing metamorphosis. They get a big eye, they develop a sucker mouth, and they develop teeth, and then they decide it's time to go down to sea. We don't know too much about this because it happens, as we'll see, during big flows. But we got a great opportunity a few years back to look at the catches in the Sacramento River where they have big, giant screw traps that trap all day long, all year long. Most places where we sample for fish, primarily salmonids, we put traps in to catch the fish, to monitor fish coming downstream, and these are expensive uh, aluminum uh, screw traps, and anytime the water is about to come up and a storm's coming through, everybody goes out, grabs their expensive trap, and brings it in. Well, of course, that's exactly when the lampreys turn out that they want to go downstream, and so nobody catches them, or only catches a few. Also, unlike salmonids, if you look at when they're going out, it can happen at any time of the year. The majority is somewhere between November and May, because that's when we get high flows, it turns out. But you can expect this to occur at any time. When we looked at our data, we saw that the last graph was all 12 years combined. This is when you break it down into a single year, and you see it's quite punctuated, that they are not dribbling out of the system whenever they can. They come out when we had big rainfalls. We had big flow events. And it all occurred within two or three days. And if you came back in four days after a rain event, you might find a couple. And you go, oh yeah, we caught a lamprey. In the meantime, look at this. This is, this is a logarithmic. So that's 5,000 here. We would get catches of 10,000, and four days later, you'd see three. And you say, oh, there are hardly any lampreys in this system. That's, that's from the Sacramento? This is from the Sacramento, so from uh, Red Bluff. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Yes, and, and this is, remember, lampreys, we go back, they've been doing this for a long time. They've figured things out that work. The environment changes a lot over time. It also is very different adapting to a stream in the Olympic Peninsula compared to adapting to a stream in northern Baja, California, where the mouth may only open every six or seven years. So the other thing they do is they go out at night. So they're moving out on high flows at night. And you say, well, why would a lamprey do something like that? Because it's been thinking about it and refining it for a long, long time. And it's figured out that if you taste really good and look like a little worm and everybody wants to eat you, when it's time for you to make a run for the ocean where you can start growing, you go out at night when nobody can see you in high flows when it's very turbid and on high flows that you can surf down to the river, so instead of taking a week or two to get down to the mouth of the river, you can be there in a matter of hours. Are these suckers smart? Oh, they are so, they are refined. So, uh, that's that. So they head out to the ocean, and they enter this giant black box where we have 
no clue what's going on, or little tidbits. However, they distribute all the way down south of Baja, California, in the open ocean, all the way up into the Bering Sea, and all the way down to Japan, where they feed as adults. Are they universal women like Ken Captain and Russia? They run up those rivers too? The, there are a few uh, found in California, in uh, California, uh, Japan. Um, Kamchatka may have a few reproductive rivers. The majority, they do not reproduce in the Bering Sea, but they feed there. And the majority are coming down from southern Alaska down to northern Baja, California. Now that would seem like a long ways to go. And it is. And when you look at an eel, you say, well, the eel's swimming, but it's not swimming very fast. And it can't jump. And it's not a very strong swimmer, something I hear all the time. No, but it's a smart swimmer. And if you look, it's a, this is something they did, I think it was Stanford's engineering department, put eels in and they put uh, plastic balls in the water so they could track the, the water movement and looked at pressure. And what we're looking at here is an eel swimming. Red eel? That's what we call them around here. Thank you. <laughs> around here we call lampreys eels. This is a lamprey. This would actually refer to an eel as well. They're both using the same etruriel. They're both using anguilliform swimming behavior, which is uh, mechanically the same or similar. But what we have here, red is high pressure on the in the water, and blue is low pressure. So what this guy is doing is similar to how an airplane flies. An airplane doesn't fly by pushing down on the air. An airplane flies by creating low pressure along the top of the wing and being held up essentially by a vacuum. So same thing with the eel. So the eel says, I have a long ways to go. Long time to get there. Uh, so he swims very efficiently, 24 seven down in the dark. And it turns out that when we look at swimming speeds, they're covering probably around 20 kilometers a night. Now, if you're in the open ocean and you drop down a few hundred meters, you're in the dark, you can, you're, you're safe from visual predators. You could probably swim all day long. You hook up to the California current or something and you want to go from the Columbia to San Francisco Bay, it's only going to take you about three weeks to move that far. Compare that to somebody walking the PCT and you're doing okay. <laughs> so very start, smart swimmers, they don't swim fast, but they swim incredibly efficiently. And when we watch them swimming, they swim down by the bottom. The reason they swim down by the bottom is because the bottom is a boundary zone. And so by definition, velocity in the, in the river declines to zero on the bottom. But right above the bottom, in the inch above the bottom, especially in a rough bottom, the water is very, very slow. So you'll see, if you ever want to swim across the river, you guys, river people, you never swim across the top of the river. You go down to the bottom of the river, down in the boulders, and you swim across, and you find all the fish sitting there just sort of lazing around with the water zipping over their head. Are there any ocean in schools? We don't have a clue what they're doing in the ocean. Um, so here's, here's an adult feeding, uh, feeding adult from the Bering Sea. This is their teeth, for which they get a really bad rap. Okay. Uh, these are all made out of chitin, just like a beetle carapace. And sometimes people tell me, you know, well, lampreys are really gross. They've got these horrible teeth. And I say, what I'd like you to do is go home and take your 12-time mirror on your, in your bathroom and open your mouth up as wide as you can and take a picture of yourself and tell me how pretty you look. This is not a lamprey's best angle. Okay? 
However, what it uses these teeth for has a sucker mouth, so it sucks on its prey or the, the organism that's going to parasitize. Oh, that's the teeth. And we're getting to that. And it sucks on, and then it uses these teeth to gouge out an introductory hole, and then its tongue has teeth on it, it's, it has lingual teeth, and it uses that to carve a little bit deeper in, and then in the case of Pacific lamprey, some lampreys take chunks out, but Pacific lamprey then sucks fluids, blood and other fluids, out of the body of the host. The host doesn't die, an adult, an adult host doesn't die. We do see mortality when uh, small lampreys on a, little, on a little fish. But generally, if you look at host species, they have old, healed up scars on them. Because the lamprey's going on, it's sucking some fluids out, and then it's dropping off and go to, to a next host. Now, that sounds kind of gross, okay? But I want to go through what a salmon does when it feeds. A salmon, beautiful silvery fish going through the water, and it sees a little fish it likes, a herring or something like that. It shoots over, it grabs it with a few hundred needle sharp teeth, pierces it, then swallows it alive, where it goes down into its throat where it has a set of molars called pharyngeal teeth, and it goes <coughs> like that, and crunches it up a little bit, at which point, still alive, the fish is passed down into its stomach where it's immersed in a bath of acid. <laughs> okay, I rest my case. So lampreys are pretty gentle. It, we don't know how it approaches the prey, but when we look at freshwater lampreys attacking prey, they'll be down by the bottom, and as the prey goes over, they'll come up and attach typically on the, on the breast or on the sides underneath the pectoral fins, and then move around. The, uh, let's see. So this is a link, so what do they eat? As I say, we just get little bits and pieces where somebody sees a scar or a wound on a fish. Um, Pollock flashes, the whole list. Um, certain things are missing here. You don't see sharks. No point in hooking up on a shark and trying to grind on it with chitinous teeth. You don't see um, <clears throat> sturgeon, which prey a lot on lampreys. Um, you gotta be a big enough fish for a lamprey to hook up onto. And you don't want a lot of scales to work your way through, and you want to fish, so I, I put myself into the mind of a lamprey, and I got a book on marine fishes off of the coast of Cal for California, and I went through page by page, may have had a beer, and I said, okay, <laughs> do I want to eat this fish? And you go through the sharks, you go, no. You go, you go through the hagfish, you go, no. <clears throat> you go through little sculpin and things, and you go, that's a waste of my time. And what you basically come up with that has soft flesh, has uh, no scales to work on, occurs in schools, so you can drop off and hook up on another, on another fish. Um, and another idea is that if you're a lamprey sitting on the side of a fish, looking like a big giant worm, you don't want to be up in the light where the other fish are saying, oh look, there's something to eat. So you want something that at in the daytime, maybe down deep where it gets dark, where all these fish hang out. So when I went through, I came up with hake. Hake would be an ideal lamprey food. And we're going to get back to that. But first I want to point out that this is what the lamprey did to the lingcod, and this is what the lingcod did to the lamprey. <laughs> so I wouldn't suggest feeding on, on lingcod. Uh, so the, the, this looks like about maybe a three and a half, four foot lingcod, something like that. And uh, an adult lamprey will get up about 80 centimeters, up about like that, and be about like a, a Red Bull can. The tribal guys always say, oh yeah, I caught a Coke can, but I'm thinking Red Bull, maybe in the day, but Red Bull cans are a good, good thickness. 
So I went down to Mbari and looked at their, uh, down the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute where they do ROV exploration of Monterey Canyon, very cool stuff. And when I put in, did a search for lampreys, all the lamprey sightings I got were during hake uh, dives or were associated with a hake. And so here we get a glimpse we're down at 400 meters. It's nice and dark there. I've been there. And you're down near the bottom. You've got hake there in big schools. And you got lamprey feeding on it. We also see that when you look at the decline of lamprey populations, it's associated. It's associated. We don't know the cause and effect. But it's associated with us figuring out how to use hake to make fake crab meat. Before that, we really weren't fishing for them. So, if you need a ride, we also see them on whales. Now look, look, look here. All these, what I would say are, are healed scar scars from lampreys on the whale. The whale doesn't care if it's carrying a couple lampreys to Baja. Pretty good size there. Pretty good sized whale, pretty good sized lamprey. And the, uh, when you think about it, you have soft, soft skin, no scales. As soon as you get into it, you're in fat, rich blubber. It's a good place to be feeding. And nobody's messing with you. You don't want to hang on the side of a tuna, if you've ever seen tuna feeding. OK, so they go offshore. They kind of disappear. They're feeding. And they're growing from about this long to about this long. We don't know how long that takes, but that's how long they're out there to get that, that size. And then they come back into the coast. Now here in the Northwest, we're very accustomed to the idea of fish coming back to the stream where they were born, a natal fidelity to the stream. Turns out that lamprey don't work that way. Instead of adapting to a single stream, <coughs> lampreys, as we talked about on their out migration, they've adapted to a wide range of environmental conditions and uh, behaviors in this stream. And so what they do, this was one of the first studies that um, I did with a grad student of mine. Um, we looked at the genetic structure along the coast. And what we found was that there isn't any. This is a tough thing to explain to your graduate committee, but it turns out to really shift the paradigm. We went into this study thinking, oh, it's going to be cool. We're going to find all these unique populations down the coast. Instead, what we found was a giant mishmash. The whole coastal population from Southern California into Alaska is genetically indistinguishable. So what's the benefit of that? Well, for a lamprey, a lamprey is saying, when I'm ready to go into shore, I'm just going to go into whatever river Any seems to work. Storm. Any port in a storm. And what I'm going to do, we don't really know what, what cues them in as to which river they go into. A couple of the things are, one, the presence of amicetes, because they can smell the amicetes. They put out a chemical pheromone. Other adults, they can also smell the adults. The other thing is that they get a big fresh, you know, you go, you look at the ocean after a big, Big storms going, you got this big plume of fresh water, you know, with a different color, different taste. And you say, any river that's producing that much water is going to have a lot of habitat for me. The other thing is that we have looked, all these red dots are sample, are places we sampled. The, this grabster, Damon Goodman, who's a colleague of mine, uh, has been for 16 years now. It's pretty good. Um, he, he was thinking about becoming a graduate student, and he was getting, he was all ready to go to Alaska and give up on it. And I said, you know, I called him up. He was out in his front yard with his truck packed and his girlfriend, now mother of his three children, in the truck ready to go. And I said, here's the deal. I don't have any money. I live six hours away from the university. This is down at Humboldt. I live six hours away from the university, but I've got this really cool project. And we're going to go to Canada, and then we're going to drive down the coast to Mexico, and we're going to get in every creek along the way 
and sample the genetics of the fish in there. And so I said, okay, done. <laughs> so anyway, that's what we did, and we found nothing, no pattern at all. But we found lampreys in almost every creek, any creek over about 25 kilometer square drainage area going into the coast. So almost any, any large creek we found <coughs> lampreys in. So it's a pretty good bet. Here's some of our sample sites. Uh, this is the Cespi, the, the uh, Tar Canyon, the uh, Condor Refuge. This is down in Baja. That's Dr. Gorgonio Ruiz Campo, who's a colleague down there in Ensenada. That's Damon up in the Olympic Peninsula, etc. A lot of different habitats. So you come in, you say, I'll go in any river. I feel funny talking to this crowd because you guys really know about lampreys coming in and getting eaten. But lampreys come into shore and everybody wants to eat them. They have a really high nutritive value for the tribes. They were the first big migration coming in after the winter. So the times, the lean times, all of a sudden lampreys came in, they were abundant, you could catch them easily, and they had huge fat reserves. They're very, very important for the tribes and still are that if you go visit a tribal elder, you don't take them salmon, that you're, it's much more appreciated if you can show up with a few eel for them. Sea lions eat them. It's a, when you go to a spot that has a lot of lamprey on it and you put a game camera up, it is amazing how many things are eating. We have footage of raccoons, minks, otters, bears, vultures, golden e I mean bald eagles, Ospreys, <coughs> sea lions, everybody, people, everybody's eating. Stuart, I have a big question. Yeah. How do those otters catch those lambers out of, I've been out there a lot of times, I've never seen them out there. How come they can catch those things? <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of the lampreys will come up uh, in the, in the surf zone, I know, you don't see them unless you're out there looking. Nobody sees lamprey. The um, gentleman was saying, you know, I'm, I'm out here with my Polaroid glasses all the time looking in the estuary. I don't see lampreys and boom, the ospreys come in and grab them. The, um, they're they're counter shaded, one thing, they're counter shaded so they're dark on top. When they're coming in, they're kind of bluish, on, dark bluish on top silvery on the bottom, so that's designed to keep people, things from seeing them from up above. But uh, I don't know, you know, so it turns out once they come in, lampreys, okay, so they come in, they're everywhere, this is a, we did a distribution, I'm getting off track here, but this is a distribution in California, these lines are the historical distribution, and as we'll see, the only constraint here, we're, we've got something going on in Southern California that we're looking at, and then all the other reds are reaches that are blocked by big impassable dams. So that's going to be part of the story coming up. Um, so they're coming in. Well, it, we had something we were thinking about, we'll get back to it. But when they're coming in, they find a river and they move upstream. Oh, I know, it's how long they stay in the river and we're gonna get to that. So they come up, they follow the stream up and they go as far as they can until they hit an impassable barrier. Naturally, a, a natural impassable barrier in the past. This isn't an impassable barrier. This is what we call a lamprey ramp. Okay. This is the upper limit for salmon, but not for lamprey. Because lamprey have been thinking about this. And they've seen a lot of waterfalls in their day. And when they find a waterfall, they don't try to jump over it. They go over here in the splash zone, and they just climb up the wet rocks with their sucker mouth. So they go, like we saw in the beginning. So this is down Illinois River Falls in 1912. Where is 
And how far down the river? That, that is um, about 10 miles downstream of Cave Junction. So kind of at the top of the canyon before you get into the Illinois Valley. And turns out that's a really useful thing to be able to do is climb over a waterfall. Because here we are, good question. Uh, here we are at Illinois River Falls where salmon pretty much stopped, except maybe in high flow years. But lampreys are able to get over it at any time that they're coming up the river, any time they're migrating. And they're migrating pretty much from November, they're coming in into early June. And so even with relatively low flow, they're able to go over. And it opened up the entire Illinois River Valley to lampreys. About 70 miles plus. They do that same thing at Willamette Falls. That's up to Willamette. They and they go they right over the Willamette Falls. They, go, they crawl up Willamette Falls. And we have a picture of that as it happens. <laughs> so the, uh, and there's another aspect to this. This is great for lampreys. But lampreys come up, and after they spawn, similar to some of the salmonids, they die. And they're bringing, they're a route to bring marine nutrients, all the riches. They went from this big to this big out in the ocean. Then they bring all that biomass upstream, above this falls, where they're pretty much the only anadromous species to do this. And after they spawn and die, all those nutrients go back into the system, into the rivers. So they move in. As soon as they enter fresh water, they quit feeding. At that point, we were talking earlier, at that point when they've stopped feeding, they start using their body mass for energy and to develop their eggs and gonads. And they will actually shrink about six or eight inches over the next year when they're holding in fresh water and they're getting ready to spawn. These people have a real low metabolism? They have a real rich body that they're using. So one of the things about lampreys is you see a lamprey come in at the river mouth and you say, okay, they're coming in to spawn. Well, they are coming in to spawn, but they're coming in to spawn frequently. In general, they're spawning the next year. Some may spawn right away, but the majority are spawning the next year. Well, that means that they're holding over in the river for a year. So in the rivers, we have adult lampreys, which is very important thinking about restoration projects and activities in the river. We have adult lampreys in the river all year long, but nobody sees them. They're buried down in the, in the gravels, in the boulders, under the banks, in the roots, in between rocks. But they're there. During that time, they develop their gonads, and then they get ready to spawn. And lampreys, they build a red, a nest, to spawn in. And they do this with their sucker mouth, picking up... They brought me water. Thank you. They pick up rocks and they assemble them to create a nest. So they don't do it by digging out a nest. They create this nest. And I was down in the Napa River a while back. It was like 2 o'clock in the morning, beautiful full moon. And I'm sitting there watching this lamprey building its nest, about that big. I have my, my chin on the edge of the nest and my mask. And, and I'm holding on a log or a rock or something to keep from getting washed downstream. Reasonable flow. And I suddenly realized, wait a second, here's this lamprey, who everybody says isn't a very good swimmer anyway. But he's tootling around this depression, doing whatever he wants, picking up rocks, and you could watch him because they'd come over and they'd look at you occasionally. And he's sensing where there's flow and moving rocks to control the flow in his little nest. And he's sitting there, because he's going to be here for about two weeks, he's sitting there in zero velocity. And I'm holding on to keep from washing downstream. And you, you could watch him, and here we go. 
and put it, it's like watching a beaver build a dam when they hear the water, they go and plug it. Very specific. So they build this in, we often think they build in large gravel and cobble at the tail of pools. Do you know why we think that? Because that's where everybody goes and looks for salmon reds. It turns out that when you look for lamprey reds, they can be almost anywhere because they'll, they'll open up a space between two boulders. I gave a talk in Grants Pass and there was a guy there who said they would go scuba diving in the Illinois River and there was this one ranch that has a, a cut in the bedrock and they go down about 30 or 40 feet down, have to take lights down so they can see and they'll find lamprey spawning on the bottom of that. So anywhere they want, they're spawning. They, the male starts to build the, the red. The female comes in. They spend about two weeks there. And then they spawn and they die. And their bodies decompose very rapidly. But I think for anybody who remembers maybe the 70s from here on the coast, the rivers, people will tell me, and I wasn't, I wasn't there for that in these rivers. I was in different rivers. Um, and that the rivers just stank from the number of dead lampreys that were lying on the bottom rotting. And that's a huge pulse of nutrients into the system. So here they are, they're building a red. You can see it looks sort of haphazard, except that it's going to end up giving them all the cover they need. And actually here, here's a little brook lamprey who's sneaking in to use that area as well. So now, so does each one build its own red or will Because if you had two there, would they build a common red? Yeah, it looks like in, in Pacific lamprey, the males come in first, they start building the red, and then females will come into the red. And there's some swap, we, we see multiple numbers in. Uh, nobody's really looked at the uh, individuals to say who's, you know, who's associating with who. One, one of the really cool things about lampreys, as you've gotten the impression, we don't know too much about them. And so what that means from the standpoint of somebody wanting to study them at any level is anything that seems interesting to you, like, well, are these two individuals paired up? Are they, you know, mated for the long term? Or is it a different female that keeps coming in? We don't know. That would be, that's wide open for study. When they're spawning, it looks like they're in zero gravity. They're down behind the thing, they're just floating. They're, they're down in this, they've created this low velocity red nest area, so they don't, they're not dealing with flow. They're in water, they're the same density. So you see them moving rocks, her moving rocks. Now those are three or four feet long at this point? Uh, about 18 to 20 inches now. Shrunk down. They've shrunk down. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> One of the cool things about lampreys is that when they're doing this, they could care less about you. So if you can ever get out in a creek when they're spawning, you can sit right there with them and watch everything they're doing and they're oblivious to you. Is that the same kind of thing they lay eggs and then they melt on them? Yeah, so that little cloud you saw coming off was, was melting eggs. Okay, so we've answered the question. And what I want to do now is touch a little bit. Yes? What's milt? Milt is the sperm, the fish's sperm, the male reproductive cells. So, how are we doing on time? You are doing fabulous. Okay. Yeah. This is very exciting. So, I want to touch on this conservation initiative that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service came up with. Uh, I worked with Damon, who was the, the, the colleague who did the genetic work, and um, he's with U.S. Fish and Wildlife. I have a cooperative agreement with him, and we handle 
lamprey conservation issues primarily for the state of California. In, that's our sort of area under this program. So back in maybe 2003, there was a petition to list the lamprey under the Endangered Species Act. And it was, it was clear from the, um, from the available information that the population was declining. The threats were not exactly clear, but the population, because of the fact that it's a huge metapopulation from Alaska to, to Baja, was not clear under the petition. And so it was turned back and they said, for administrative and data purposes, we have a finding of, of that we're not gonna list them. But what they came up with, which I'm really positive on, is this conservation initiative of, well, yeah, we know this is a species that we have a lot of concerns about. Maybe we should front load and instead of waiting till it gets listed, maybe we should start conservation actions early on. It seemed for the, a government agency, this was pretty good. Anyway, it turns out that this has worked really, really well because it has opened up, there's no regulatory burden in this program, and it has opened up relationships that otherwise are really confrontational with landowners, with water districts, with the Bureau of Reclamation. We're able to develop partnerships and develop projects without having to go through the the confrontation we so often see under the Endangered Species Act. So I have water districts that call up and say, hey, could we put a ladder over our diversion for lampreys? We'll, we'll, we'll pay for it, let's just get it done. And it's like, yes, let's do that. And we're learning a lot, which we didn't know. So why were they petitioned? Here's Willamette Falls, back in uh, 1913. There were a lot of lampreys in these rivers. Imagine how many amicids that many lampreys. I, th this is where I put it, is what did the sand feel like when you waited at the swimming beach <laughs> when you had that many lampreys in the system? And we have seen since the 70s, we have seen this substantial decline. Now that said, we. Not very well. Um, this was in the Umpqua at Winchester Dam there, right off the I-5, and uh, this was at Gold Ray Dam, uh, now gone. Um, a lot of what we deal with with lamprey information is almost anecdotal or at, you know ancillary to the main projects of monitoring salmonids. So <clears throat> they were marking down when they saw lampreys, but they really didn't care. And they may have been taking some of these and throwing them up on the bank at the time after they counted them. So the information is not too rigorous, but there's a clear decline to anybody who's been watching the rivers and to the, uh, and the towns. That said, we can go to any river in the, on the West Coast and within about 20 seconds, I can give you lampreys. So they're still very widespread. There are constraints, such as the passage issues that we find at dams. Um, but we really are trying to identify what, what caused this, this drop. And I would say we have a lot of conservation concerns, such as passage barriers, which have blocked 40% of the historical habitat. But we don't necessarily know what's driving the... What's the law of the Reagan years? Huh? What's the law of the Reagan years? That, that could have been it. As I say, if you, if you look at the production of fake crab meat, it goes like this. Yes? So what's the main problem of why there are barriers? Are there dams? So the dams that were put in primarily in the 50s, 60s, 70s with no fish passage. This is particularly in the Sacramento drainage and in the Klamath. The Columbia River has dams, but they're built with fish ladders, but the fish ladders are for salmon. And we've seen this is a very different creature than a salmon, and it gets over barriers in a very different way. Uh, excuse me, that yes. spike in 85, when it um, really increased, we were going through a drought right then, and 
Not a clue. Not a clue. And it, so the, the first thing is not a clue. The other is this can also be due to having somebody working at the fish ladder who liked lampreys and paid attention. Oh, they got funded. <laughs> no, they didn't get it. I assure you, nobody got funded for lampreys in 1985, and they barely get it now. So when we look at our management considerations in freshwater. So not thinking about what's going on offshore. Our big, big issue is passage. 40% of historical habitat has been lost due to just the dams. Another issue is entrainment where they're sucked into diversions and the watering of the rivers, not so much an issue down here or along the coast, but in other areas like the Salinas, it's very important and the issue of habitat conditions, which are not what you might think they would be. First passage. So this, you recognize this is the dam they were trying to climb uh, in that movie at the beginning. This is Van Arsdale Dam on the Eel River, a beautiful spot. We've turned it into a bit of a lamprey research station. Um, again, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, who operates this, owns the dam has been totally open to us doing any experimentation we want to do there, working with the lampreys. It doesn't cost them anything, and we're finding ways to get the lampreys over so it solves their problem for them. Um, this is a fish ladder. It has 50, 50 pools going up over the uh, dam. The dam's um, about 20 meters high, about 60 feet high. They used to say that there were some lampreys that tried to go up this fish ladder. We started looking at it and we experimented around. The short, uh, short story is we tried putting apertures that they could go through the fish ladder. We tried putting rounded pickle barrels over the top that they could climb over. We tried a whole bunch of things and what we found worked best was a four inch PVC tube. <laughs> So we now have 250 feet of four inch PVC tube that starts down here at the beginning of the fish ladder. The lampreys climb up this little helix. They go up over and around. We can lay it anywhere we want. We can fit it into the existing structure. It doesn't interrupt any of the operations. And when we looked at, we pit tag, we put little um, passive um, transmitters on all these lamprey. We sent them up the fish ladder to see what took longer, etc. And we found that the regular fish ladder was taking three weeks for the 10% of the fish that actually made it to the top. We put in our tube and it takes them an average of three hours to go over this dam. That's correct. One of those Nope, there's, they're in here. This actually, this is great. Is that one in here? Yeah, that's a lamp, right? Inside there, we actually only run half an inch of water. So we just keep it wet, and they go right up it. I don't quite understand, because you were showing us before that they were climbing up. So they get in, they get in the tube. If they were on a wall, they would go. Yeah. But why don't they go up the wall? Why do they try to go up the ladder? The, that, the wall, in that particular move was taken after a really high flow when a whole bunch got into that sort of secondary pool and they had to try to get out and they weren't successful getting over the, the very ultimate top. There's some really sharp edges up there. However, in that little pause here, so up in this second thing, they were, and they were climbing up this bedrock in the back and there was this one big pool on their route. You see how they kind of go in these streams up the up pathways. There was this one pool about like two big bathtubs. And we were out there about one o'clock in the morning. And this stream of lampreys is going through there. And the whole pool is just a mass of lampreys moving through. And I thought, oh, you can't resist this. So most modestly, I stripped mostly down 
and hopped in this pool or let myself into the pool. Now, I can macho a lot of stuff. I knew I could do that. But what I found was this was the most peaceful experience of my life, literally. And I was in there. They were moving. I had hundreds of lampreys moving across me. They're just sucking on like you're a rock. They're sort of snuggling. They're used to a lot of body contact. So having another rubbery body in there didn't bother them. There was no... That's kind of kinky, buddy. It's pretty kinky. <laughs> but I can really recommend it. <laughs> but at any rate, this was, this was a, a fascinating experience. And like I say, they were just moving along. You were part of the structure. It was, it was, it was really nice. Okay, let's get back. So, so they go up this little... So that's why they can't go, go over the dam. They're not able to get over the dam. So they try to go up the fish line, but it doesn't work. We run them up the tube, 250 uh, feet. 2017, we had 12,000 lampreys go through this four-inch tube. We now have two tubes. We also have up here, this is that steel, that aluminum box is our, um, with the antenna reader where we can read as they make their way up. And then we have a box where we have clear section of tube in the box and a video camera. So we get a, a video of each lamprey moving through. We can measure it and count it. How do they find the, the entrance to the tube? Like you the know, okay, so that looks, and this is a back corner, okay? First, how do you figure out how to get lampreys over a dam? Well, you have to learn to think like a lamprey. You have to understand what they're doing. So we spent a lot of time out at night just hanging out. Remember, they're moving it mostly at night, hanging out on the ladder, watching where they're going, how they're behaving, where they're having problems, where they're making progress. Stuart, this is way up the hill. How far is this the ocean? About 150 miles up. Remember, these guys used to go up to Idaho. 150 miles is, is nothing. Well, it's been three years. No, no. So, this area back here, there was overflow coming through this sub-compartment, and so they were really, they would go and try to go up this wall, which didn't really take them anywhere. And so that's why we put that, that entry is a highly engineered uh, floor register from Home Depot for $7.59. <laughs> um, the green, uh, you can see the toilet fittings, et cetera, uh, all ABS pipe a roll of PVC pipe, and a video monitoring system. Our whole setup there was about $3,500 to get them over a 60-foot dam. Do you have any um, response from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service? Are they going to do this stuff? Or, or? Well, that's what we're doing. As I say, this is something Damon and I work on together. He's with Fish and Wildlife Service. We spend a lot of time. We just put one of these down on the Russian River. I put one down on the Santa Clara. Um, we're looking at Los Padres Dam on the Carmel. We're putting one uh, with the Talawa tribe down on Rowdy Creek. So yes, we're, we're really trying to apply these. We're, we're getting ready to, to do that there. We just got funding. This was San Luis Obispo Creek where they're testing the amacetes. They put in a modification of this weir down in the estuary, which allowed steelhead to jump over, but it blocked lampreys because it had an overhanging edge. And we lost the entire population from San Luis Obispo Creek. It was the southernmost uh, population at that time. Oh, that's not bad. And, <clears throat> well, people wonder about that because there weren't any amacetes here. But the first thing we did is dig into our pocket change, and for $314 for this project, we put in a piece of used stainless steel, wrapped it over the top, bolted it on, and as of my birthday, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day of 2017, we now have lampreys <laughs> and spawning in Central Plaza in San Luis Obispo, and they have totally repopulated. We, we're monitoring the population. The whole system is full of lampreys now. $314. Is there are bigger problems. 
This is uh, down in the Sacramento Delta. This is the depressing part. This sucks most of the water out of the Sacramento and San Joaquin. It actually turns the San Joaquin River backwards when it's uh, pulling out. Um, it turns out that the fish barriers they have there are of no use whatsoever. So we worked with the BOR. Again, since it's not regulatory, we got good cooperation from the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, anybody here from the Bureau of Reclamation? Well, I consider that a miracle, that we got good cooperation. And uh, we actually figured out that there's, an, a, there's a screen they are now using. First, it was sucking them all. Then they put in a partial screen, and it works. So there is a solution to this if it's applied. This is California water. Uh, when you work on lampreys, you pick your fights. Um, don't they have to screen for like the smelts and other fish too, or is it just all the same? This is the Sacramento Delta, and it's beyond me. <laughs> Yet, yes, there's a lot of issues there. There's an issue. There's an issue with that. Yes, there's an issue with that. Uh, this is the Salinas River. Um, we, when we take the groundwater out of the rivers, when these river, when the flow comes down, the big rush, the adults are able to get up in high flows, and they spawn, and the amicetes rear, and then they get a big flow, and they go, ha, this is our chance. It's worked for 400 million years. They head downstream, and the river never makes it to the ocean. It gets sucked out. So that is, that's a big one we're working on. Habitat quality, this leads us into the Rogue Valley, and I've really gone over time, and I apologize. It's okay. But it's okay. And so the Rogue Valley, we had a great project. Like I said, there's not a lot of money for lampreys in the world, and we've been looking for water, uh, for water, for money to survey the entire Rogue Basin for lampreys to understand their distribution. Because in order to understand an animal, the first thing you want to do is know where it is. Once you know where it is, you can think about why it's there. Once you understand why it's there, you can start to manage it, manage it and understand what's going on. Anyway, so we had a big problem with that, getting any funding. And finally, we said to heck with it. And all the watershed councils chipped in a little bit of money apiece and provided the funding for me to go out and survey the, the Rogue Valley, and we came up with some really good, music. and we, we have the, the Applegate Watershed Council is here, and um, and and um, Kelly helped from down here in the Lower Rogue, looking at the Lower Rogue sites, and we got it done. That's one thing we've sort of tried to approach this whole thing, is let's just get these things done, put a tube over the, the dam, go out and do the surveys get these things done, talk to people, get support. So, to, to let you know where they are in the, uh, in the rogue system, here's our sample set. So I went around to all these dots and looked for lampreys. Left the wild and sea a little bit alone. It's really high gradient and rocky, hard to get into. Uh, we know they get through it. And you can see all the blue dots are where they are. And yellow dots are where they weren't. And red triangles are where the river was dry, which eliminated them in that reach. A lot of different habitats here in the road. Here's um, Lobster Creek's interesting. Lobster Creek just up from the mouth. The lower end is full of cobble and very well washed. And there's no amicetes in it because they have nowhere to live. But when you go further up in, we're able to get access. And um, it turns out that when you get in these big pools that have fines, there were plenty of uh, lampreys up there. Sucker Creek, Grave Creek. I thought we were talking about lampreys, though, right? No, I think they were talking about, correct, Brian, you know, were they talking about people from Illinois? <laughs> no, I'm, no, I'm serious. I'm serious. I think it was colonizers. Don't be a sucker. <laughs> <laughs> it was colonizers from somewhere that, where they refer to them as suckers. I think that's true. There is a sucker up there. There's all, I don't think they, it was named yeah, after. You're right. The Illinois River, they call them suckers, right? They're there you go. They were suckers, not not suckers. Yeah. Do you call them squawfish? 
Okay, don't get me started on squawky. The, the correct word is pipe minnow, but that's a whole different lecture that I'd love to give. Um, another fish that everybody ignores, um, a wonderful fish. I was just out of watching them uh, this afternoon, the uh, introduced one here in the road. It's still a very pretty fish out of the Umpqua. Anyway, no, uh, squawfish refers to a big minnow compared to the suckers that are, have the bottom, the, the graze on the bottom where the sucker is. So we have suckers in the rogue, and also now we have pike minnows. The eagles love The eagles love suckers, suckers yes. Oh, and actually, and, 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 and pike minnow too. Yeah, pike minnow, sorry. <laughs> I, I say that because I, was, I grew up calling them squawfish in California. And I was out surveying up in the upper Pitt River a number of years ago with a colleague who's a Pitt River Indian woman. And we were talking fish and eating our lunch next to the creek, and I mentioned squawfish, and I still have the scars on my back. <laughs> anyway, and very valid points of sensitivity with the, the terminology. Um, and it's a beautiful fish. It's one of our largest. The one here isn't a very big minnow. The one in California, the pike minnow gets about that big, and the one in the Colorado gets about six feet long. So this is a substantial are you standing up for squawfish? Huh? Are you standing up for squawfish? Oh, yeah. Okay, so we get back to lampreys here. And what was really driving absence in the rogue was either high gradient, where we have no, no sands for them to rear, or stream reaches that were going dry in the summertime. And that's where we mostly didn't feed. That explained most absences. Now this is interesting. We look, you look at these two pools and you go, God, that's pretty. Look at that. That's got beautiful clear water and it has some little trout in it. And you look at this, you go, oh, look at that pool. It's kind of murky and sandy and silty. So this pool has maybe two species of fish in it, three species of fish in it. They mostly have to live on bugs that fall in from outside because it's such poor water. This pool has maybe eight to ten species in it. It's loaded with fish and it's got, as you all recognize, great lamprey habitat in it. So when we're looking from a lamprey standpoint, a stream like this probably doesn't even have lampreys in it because there's no place to rear it unless it has some beds of sand somewhere in it. Again, when we have finds, even in little isolated pools, we ended up, this is, this is the base of that. No, this is, this is a different place. But anyway, where we have finds, we had lampreys. Where we didn't have finds, we don't have lampreys. Of course, rough and ready, this was all that was left of water in rough and ready. That's up at, at the highway. The other thing we have in the, in the, the rogue, although we have made major progress on some of the really big barriers, there are smaller diversions that don't work for lampreys. When you look at this, it is nothing but sharp edges. This is a beautiful ramp. A lamprey would have no problem going up this, but then they're going to hit a steel plate or aluminum plate with edges that if you're sucking up something, you do just fine going like this. But as soon as you get to that sharp edge, you lose suction you, and you fall off. So this is designed, <laughs> couldn't be designed better to restrict lampreys. It does have a fish ladder here. This is the entry to the fish ladder. There's a close up. This is nothing but uh, U channels and sharp edges on the inside. Super high velocity that you have to swim up with nothing to hang on to. So this is one of the projects we're looking at. How can we make uh, lamprey passage here? I could put in a, a little entry right here where the lampreys are going to sit, waiting to figure out how to get in here, and run it right over the top. It's only six feet up with a, a rubber uh, with a PVC hose, and we would have solved solved the problem. So we're looking for those sorts of opportunities. Again, in the rogue, when we look at the rogue. What are the problems with lampreys? It's mostly 
either a man-made structure that's blocking it, and there aren't that many, this is, these are doable projects, and dry reaches, and especially in some of these systems where there was a lot of hydraulic mining, and it's now cobble and gravel and the sands have been washed out. Uh, we need more sand in the system, and then um, just the high gradient stuff, there aren't lampreys there, but we wouldn't expect them to be. And it's, it's important to realize that, you know, each fish species has, has places it should be and shouldn't be. And if they're not where uh, they shouldn't be, that isn't a problem. But they should be where they should be. <laughs> Did you get that idea? So, in conclusion, think sand. Thank you very much. You know what? I did not take this picture, and I was going through cleaning up my computer, and I saw this thing that said lamprey cloud on it, and I have no, it's on my computer. I have no idea where it came from. So, thank you.